What would happen to you if you were unable to make your own health care decisions? Would you get the type of care you would want? Would your loved ones know enough about your values and your beliefs to make those decisions? Would you want those decisions left to the court or to trusted loved ones who know what's important to you? I've worked uh, for a long time in the emergency room at Rochester General, so I lot of, saw a lot of people coming in that we were resuscitating for whatever reason. And I can't tell you how many times um, family members who were quibbling with each other would say, keep them alive. The other person would say, don't keep them alive. And I, would, I knew that I never wanted to be in that position. I worked in intensive care units as well, and I've seen the eyes of people that are being kept alive because of reasons like that. And I just, I don't ever want to, to be tormented like that. And I think that in a way it can be very tormenting because somebody has made a decision for you that you would not want them to make for you. So I would really encourage people that they have to make that decision. You know, we spend more time thinking about, you know, what car we're going to buy or what piece of clothing we're going to buy when ultimately, you know, we're not thinking about something as serious as that. Planning for future medical care when you're unable to make your health care decisions is a process called advanced care planning. It results in the completion of advanced directives. In New York State, there are two documents, the health care proxy and the living will. Everyone 18 and older should complete advanced directives. While advanced directive documents differ in other states, the advanced care planning process remains the same. View the New York State advanced directives at CompassionAndSupport.org and other state-specific documents at CaringInfo.org. The healthcare proxy is a legal document that lets you name someone to make decisions about your medical care, including life support. The person named in the healthcare proxy to make decisions is called a healthcare agent. You should also name an alternate healthcare agent in the event your healthcare agent is unavailable. You must indicate that your healthcare agent knows your wishes regarding artificial hydration and nutrition. Otherwise, your healthcare agent cannot decide for you. To be legal, the healthcare proxy must be signed, dated, and have two witnesses. Consider being an organ donor. Complete the organ donor section on the healthcare proxy. The living will lets you state your wishes about medical care in the event you develop an irreversible condition. It is used if you become terminally ill, permanently unconscious, or minimally conscious due to brain damage and will never regain the ability to make decisions. These documents are only used when you cannot make your own decisions. When the need arises, advanced care planning reduces uncertainty about what you would want and avoids potential conflict among loved ones. Advanced care planning provides peace of mind for you and your family. If you haven't completed your advanced directive, the following five steps will guide you through the advanced care planning process. Step one, learn about advanced directives by reading the advanced care planning booklet or viewing it on the web. Step two, identify reasons why you don't want to do an advanced directive. These may include, I don't know enough about it. It isn't important. I don't have enough time. I don't know how to bring it up with my family. I don't want to think about it or discuss it. It's too difficult. Step three, motivate yourself by focusing on the benefits. Step four, complete your healthcare proxy and living will. After you've completed your advanced directives, have a conversation with your family and healthcare provider. Make sure you've chosen the right healthcare agent and alternate and discuss your values, beliefs, and what is important to you. Share copies of your completed advanced directives with your healthcare agent, your alternate, and your provider. Step five, review and update your advanced directives periodically. Advanced care planning should be considered by all individuals along the health illness continuum, starting with healthy and independent individuals up to and including those approaching the end of life. There needs to be a shift to earlier completion of advanced directives by encouraging individuals to initiate the process when they are healthy. The stories you are about to hear will focus on both the benefits of advanced care planning and the burdens for both patients and families 
when patients fail to plan. Joanne's uncle had an enlarged heart, diabetes, and was on dialysis. He did not complete an advanced directive or speak to his family about his wishes. He spent the last three months of his life in the intensive care unit on life support. He had every conceivable life support piece of equipment on him. That was very painful uh, for the whole family and also it was a time of great indecision. His immediate family, and it carried out to all of us, were trying to decide when to pull the plug and it was very painful. He did not have a health care proxy and he thought he had the time to be able to sit down with my aunt and decide what the last few days of his life would be. He never got that chance. He had um, an enlargement of the heart and diabetes. He was on kidney dialysis. He was on um, a PEG tube, which is a tube to feed in the stomach. They were doing everything conceivably possible. It was like a modern technology at its height. And he was suffering for three solid months. That could have all been prevented. The guilt, the sadness, the pain, that can all be taken from a family member. If you love your family, then you'll do this for your family, even if you don't think it's important for yourself. And I think that's one of the key things that I thought of when I did it. I'm thinking of my family, and I have a plan in place, and that kind of peace of mind, there's no price tag on that. Maurice's uncle had end-stage emphysema and told his family he was ready to die. But his uncle never did an advanced directive, and his uncle's son never accepted his wishes. He started thinking about, uh, you know, I don't want to go through this anymore. Uh, if something else happened, you know, let me go. But he never put it in writing. You know, he told his son and his wife, it got to the point that none of the treatments were working on him anymore. And his son did not believe that he should die. So he would take him from hospital to hospital, you know, on a weekly basis. Up to this day, he still doesn't understand that his father wanted to go. And his father took it upon himself to not suffer anymore. He still hasn't gotten over it. Um, he's still very upset about it. He, he decided uh, what his father wanted is not what he wanted. So he was going to do everything possible to save him. Catherine's brother developed a sudden, unexpected illness originally thought to be a stroke but was quickly found to be a rapidly progressive brain cancer. He had not completed an advanced directive, nor had he discussed his wishes prior to this acute illness. He was able to appoint Catherine as his health care agent when he was first admitted. It's very heartfelt when you want to hold on to that individual and keep them alive as long as possible. But knowing his being and who he was, he was full of life. He loved to cook, he loved to garden, he loved to entertain. And not having that quality of life help my, myself and my family make those decisions um, that there was no sense. If he, if he didn't have that type of quality and he couldn't speak to us and laugh, and he, he enjoyed laughing so much. And, uh, that why, why prolong his life if it wasn't going to get better and the prognosis was not going to get better that he would speak again. So we decided to not do anything and not do any radiation or further treatment, just give him a very comfortable um, passing. I think it's um, very important 
that you let your loved ones know how, how you want end of life to happen. Um, because there has always been doubt in my mind that we, slight doubt that I honored his wishes because I really didn't know my brother's wishes at the time. But I would hope that he is happy with what my family and myself have determined for him. But it is probably one of the most heartfelt, painstaking moments of my life, not really knowing that if he wanted me to treat him very aggressively or just let him pass on. But I'm hoping that having known him, you know, for 43 years of my life, that I made the correct decision for him and with my family. I think people should take action immediately. Um, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, just like our experience with our family, my brother was 53 years old, seemed a picture of health, and all of a sudden, one day, he ended up in the hospital, and unfortunately, four days later, he passed on, um, you know, with brain cancer, and did not plan, and um, made it very difficult you know, to make those decisions for him and hoping that we're honoring his wishes. Um, I think it's really important to, to do it as soon as possible to, to make sure that your wishes are honored. I don't think it can be done soon enough. Lucia's parents and siblings varied in their approach to advanced care planning. Her mother had an advanced directive, her father did not. Her sister became acutely ill and required emergency surgery for a ruptured appendix. Her sister did not have an advanced directive, and she did not have a conversation with her family before this emergency. While my sister was under, you know, just about to go into surgery, um, I immediately had the nurses in the emergency room find me a healthcare proxy form and said to my sister as she's in agonizing pain, explaining to her, you really should fill this out because you just never know. And it's almost as though I had this premonition. Um, so what ended up happening was they found a healthcare proxy form. My sister signed it with the witnesses, underwent surgery, and of course afterwards, as I mentioned, she was induced into a coma for about a week and then had to go back into surgery to be, um, to be closed. And so during that time, um, she named my brother and myself as her, her healthcare proxies. And that was a huge, huge benefit in that moment because again, unexpected crisis. Um, and little did we know at the age of 45 that she would be going through something like this. The conversation we had was very quick. Um, it was not what I would have hoped for and what I would truly hope for for anyone is to have those conversations well before anyone is ill. Tony's mother had multiple serious health conditions that resulted in acute deterioration and hospitalization. His large family is dispersed across the northeastern United States. His mother had completed an advanced directive, but she had never spoken with her family about her values and beliefs. She did have the foresight to put her wishes down into writing, but I'll tell you, you know, even going through that and looking at those, um, what she put down and what her wishes were, there was so much interpretation that you had to go through. You know, things like, you know, is if there's no chance of living, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to be left on life support. Well, what does that mean? You know, and, and very few physicians will come to you and say, hey, there's no chance, you know, there, there's always some glimmer of hope. So you're always left with some sort of life decision to make, which proved to be quite difficult. So, uh, you know, we ended up managing through that, but I found the fact that my, my mother did have some written wishes down on paper, her, you know, advanced care directives, you know, at least we had some guidelines and, and gave you some peace of mind that you were making the right decisions on behalf of her. You know, it's such a personal thing. Even, even the wishes that, that a parent makes or a loved one makes, boy, you're, you're left with making some very hard choices. You're left with, you know, things that you have to live with for the rest of your life. I had a billion questions I would have asked my mother um, and that I had to interpret. So, 
you know, to the extent that you can sit down as a family and talk these things through, I think they're tough discussions. I mean, let's not kid each other. Nobody wants to talk about them. And you might hide with, behind some humor or hide behind a little pain, but um, it's important. I think it's important you hear it from the person's mouth, what they really want and how they want things done. Deborah's mother-in-law executed a living will 50 years before her death, expressing a wish for a natural death unattached to life support. She shared her wishes in conversation with her family ahead of time. Deb's husband was his mother's health care agent. She came to the point where she wasn't eating anymore. And my husband said, you know, talked to physicians and said, well, you know, we could put, place a feeding tube. And my husband was really about to say, yeah, get mom a feeding tube. And I said, wait a minute, what are you doing? You know, your mom was adamant that she did not want artificial feeding. And it, just because she's not eating today doesn't mean that we can't continue to offer and make her comfortable and let her still make those choices of whether she eats or not. If we place a feeding tube, what would that do? It would put her at risk for infection. She could pull it out. She may not be happy with it. And, you know, it, it might not heal well. And um, he contemplated for, for quite a, a few days considering that maybe he would want to put a feeding tube in. And I pulled out her living will and I said, look, this is what your mom wants. This makes it easier for you not to make a decision that she wouldn't want. And he stuck to it. And, you know, um, you know probably about, I don't know, six months, a year later, um, she was able to, she passed away. But he was, ha he was more prepared I think with the encouragement for me to follow what his mother's wishes were and not to make decisions that, sh that were not hers. And it made him feel more satisfied. Cindy's father died of end-stage chronic lung disease. He had an advanced directive and he selected Cindy as his health care agent. Her father shared what was important to him at the end of life in conversation with her and with the family ahead of time. The last time he went into the hospital, it was clear he wasn't coming home. And the doctor came to me, being the nurse of the family, and I have three other siblings and my mother, and looked directly at me and said, do you want me to fix this? And um, everybody looked at me, and we all knew what my father's answer would have been, and it was no. After I had said to the physician, no, I don't want you to fix this, and I felt panicky, I went to the physician and I said, you know, Dr. Feldman, is this the right thing to do? And he looked at me and he said, you know, it's the right thing to do. It's what your father wanted. So he was able to reinforce, you know, the decision that my father had made because my father had had the conversation with him as well. So it took a situation that could have been um, very difficult to make that decision because you really do feel like you're ending the person's life because somebody's asking you that question. But in fact, um, I was just, you know, I was just reacting to my father's wishes. I felt a, a sense of peace because I realized it was what he wanted. And my father ended up having a very peaceful, uh, beautiful death with his family at his side where he was able to talk to them, um, share uh, a lot of stories with them, and it was a very good feeling that we took away from that um, in such a sad time. Lee's mother died a peaceful death consistent with her advanced directives after she had experienced a series of strokes. Basically, the, the doctors offered the, the choice of doing um, uh, forced nutrition. She, she, be, she had a series of strokes and she was unable to feed herself. Um, that was something she, she didn't want to be living connected to tubes. That wasn't her desire. So um, she entered a hospice program in Sun City, Arizona. And um, they took very good care of her up till the end. Um, I was there, my father was there, and um, she was comfortable. She passed as, as peacefully as she could. Lee's wife suddenly developed acute pancreatitis and septic shock after a gallbladder attack. She had an advanced directive and had selected Lee as her health care agent. They had extensive conversations about what was important to her. During the course of her illness, she was unable to make health care decisions and her advanced directive was used. I had recently um, gotten remarried and um, that experience led my wife and I to make sure that we had our health care proxies and surprisingly enough um, within a couple of months after getting remarried my, my wife had a gallbladder attack that turned into a case of 
uh, pancreatitis, which led to septic shock. <laughs> and all of a sudden, um, we were very, I was very lucky that we had filled out our, our healthcare proxies because, and I was very lucky that we had had those discussions because if we had not, um, I being only a couple months married, we, I would have had no control to make sure that the doctors gave my wife Sally the care that she wanted. And you don't get a choice. <laughs> you know, the one person getting sick, you don't have a choice. The fact that you have to make decisions, you don't have a choice. The fact that you've got to deal with all the family members at the same time, you don't have a choice. Um, the more of that that you can take care of before it happens, the more that you can talk about it, the more that you can think about it before you're in the middle of it, the better off. I can't emphasize the importance of t the conversations. That, that's really the most important thing. Um, it's, the forms are a means to an end. It, it, the forms are a way to get, get you talking. Um, the most important thing with, with my wife was knowing what her wishes were. Um, and I knew that, you know, long term, she wanted to pass away gently and comfortably and not of extraordinary means, but I knew in the short term she wanted to live a very full life and she wanted every means taken. Um, and so having that health care proxy allowed me to tell the doctors that and say, look, she wants every means taken, do whatever you can to ensure that she, she lives, and she did. Unknown to Tricia, she had a blood clotting disorder. As a result, she had an acute stroke that required emergency surgery. She had completed her advanced directives and shared her wishes with her family. They had to do the surgery very quickly and the decision had to be made in 30 minutes whether or not to do it and there was a, a risk of my death so they needed the health care proxy. My brother you know, was able then to pull it out and he said well you know and they were all there and they said well you know she doesn't want to be on a respirator and she doesn't want to, she wants to be able to care for herself and live independently and um, not, no feeding tubes and the doctors were like well, she'll be able to live independently and care for herself. And there was no question of there being no reason for a feeding tube or a respirator. They were all, the doctors were in agreement up front about that. But if you don't make this decision within the half an hour, she may die, so you need to do something fast. So they, you know, Bill said, okay, let's do it, let's roll. And they signed the form and they did the surgery and it went really well. In conversations with her family, Tricia indicated that she would agree to a trial period of life support as long as it would help her to maintain her quality of life. If her goals could not be achieved, the life support would be discontinued. I had made the decision that I didn't want to be in that long term, but if it was something that would you know, sustain me for a short time and it was just something that it would, we knew was temporary and that wouldn't you know, be a permanent state, but that we would would carry me through so that I could get to my ultimate goal of living independently, that that would be fine, and, and that's what it ended up being, so it was almost like a trial period, and just to get me to where I wanted to be, and that's exactly what it turned out to be, so that was fine, and you can be very specific like that in a healthcare proxy, and that's what's great about it. They turned out to be the most important decisions or conversations I've ever had, and the most important conversations I ever had with my dad, and that I've ever had with my siblings and my friends, and and truly their conversations that saved my life and certainly changed my life. Mary Jane's mother was diagnosed with cancer eight months before her death. She died at home, consistent with her advanced directive and conversations with her family. One of the things actually that my mother um, told us was that it was really important for her to have us around her and to be with her and she would like at all costs if at all possible to die at home. Um, she given her medical state um, and the fact that there was a hospice in the hospital we could have chosen to have her go there. We didn't do that because she made it very clear what was important to her and she was at home and we um, she was a very religious woman so we were praying taking turns praying out of the Bible and it was a very um, peaceful death. 
Mary Jane's father died of pneumonia while he was in the final stages of Alzheimer's dementia. He had an advanced directive and his family was aware of what was important to him at the end of life. But one of Mary Jane's siblings struggled with her father's wishes. My father talked about um, having continue, the importance of mental capacity and being able to communicate with his loved ones, that his quality of life was dependent upon, highly dependent upon his ability to speak and to understand conversations. Even though it was very clear what he wanted, um, it was difficult for my sister to feel comfortable with what he wanted and to basically set aside what she wanted, which was for my father at any expense to continue to live. Um, she, uh, after a, a number of discussions with my siblings, came to recognize that that was indeed, th those were indeed his wishes and that it was important to honor his wishes. Mary Jane's son died as a result of an acute head injury sustained during a high school sporting event. His final days required his family to make life support decisions and to consider organ donation. He was too young to complete an advanced directive. In the case of my son, he, um, we were told that he was brain dead. I mean, and I know the definition of brain dead, but in your head, I mean, in order to make some of these decisions, you really have to come to terms with the fact that your loved one is, is soon going to be dead. And that is so, so difficult for us, for anyone, under any circumstance, but particularly under those kind of circumstances, which again is why it's critical that, that people over the age of 18 think about these issues, talk to their loved ones, and don't put them in that kind of a situation, which is just horrendous to be in. It's just a huge burden. And it is already difficult, or it's already difficult um, having to deal with the impending death of someone that to, to throw those major decisions on the shoulders of your um, loved one or ones is just, I think, an unfair um, burden. As you've just seen, Preparing for future medical care is appropriate for all adults 18 years of age and older, not just for individuals with life-limiting illness. Anyone can have sudden and unexpected life-limiting illness or injury. The time to make your wishes known to your family and your loved ones is now, even if you're young and healthy. Our stories illustrate the key elements needed to complete a healthcare proxy and living will. Choose your health care agent, the person who speaks for you when you are unable to make your own health care decisions. There's a lot of thought that needs to take place in that process in terms of identifying a person that not only that I trust, but specifically that I trust to carry out my wishes. And um, it's also important to be able to, to choose someone that has the ability or the strength, the internal strength within to make some tough decisions to follow through with my decisions um, in an emotional time and to um, be able to really separate the two and say, okay, you know, this is how I feel, but Lucia said and has stated that she doesn't want to be resuscitated. And so someone that has the strength and the courage and the ability to respect and honor my wishes. So it's important to have a spokesperson who um, not only uh, can be there physically and also understand your values and beliefs and you can have an ongoing relationship in talking to them, but it's also important that the individual um, be assertive enough and be able to negotiate um, and handle situations where uh, loved ones 
maybe disagreeing and maybe trying to um, control the situation so that the person really has to be able to, to um, handle that well. And the need for all of us to be able to set aside um, what you would want for the individual who's dying as opposed to what the person who was dying specified was important to them. I've had probably the most talks about death, dying, and injury with my father, um, but he's in Sun City, Arizona, and I live in Rochester, New York, so having, um, having him listed on the form, that's great, but is he going to actually be able to be on site if anything happens? Not so likely. It's life and death. It, it's big stuff. Um, if you're talking about whether you want to be, you know, have be resuscitated or whether you don't want to be resuscitated, whether you know, you don't want to list somebody who's unreliable. You don't want to list somebody you don't trust. And um, although I, I haven't known my wife for as long as I've known my dad, I I trust her and. Um, that's the person I would I would want to make those decisions. I don't want if something happened to me. Sally's most likely going to be the person on site for me, and I wouldn't want her to not know what to do. I wouldn't want her to be in the position where I don't know what Lee wants. Well, I chose my brother because he's the oldest and he's very very practical. He's a he's a policeman. He's retired now, but he was a policeman at the time, and he's very there's no gray, there's black and white, and I thought that that would be the perfect person to make that kind of decision. And Fran, his, my sister-in-law is a nurse, and I thought that's you know, perfect. My, none of my other sisters or sister-in-laws are nurses or anything, so I thought that she would understand the medical side of things and be able to explain, well, 30% chance of something means this, or you know, feeding tube would mean this, and respirator would mean this, and she could explain the medical side of things to him. And, he could understand the black and white of percentages and whatnot of any kind of decision that might need to be to happen. So I thought together they made a good pair to be the to be the decision makers. As you've heard, it is important to choose your spokesperson wisely. Your healthcare agent must know you well, understand what is important to you. We'll talk about sensitive issues now. Will listen to your wishes. Is willing to speak on your behalf. Would act on your wishes. Can separate his or her feelings from yours. Will be available in the future. Lives close by or is willing to come. Could handle responsibility. Meets legal criteria. And most importantly, can manage conflicts if they arise clarifying what is important to you, your values, your beliefs, and your goals for care. When you're completing your advanced directive, it is very important to clarify your values, beliefs, and goals for care. Many people find it helpful to have a value statement. At the end of his life, Albert Einstein said, it is tasteless to prolong life artificially. I have done my share, it is time to go, I will do it elegantly. My son completed his first healthcare proxy and living will when he was 23 years old, during the time Terry Schiavo's family was in the public eye concerning her care. In his advanced directive, he stated, without my mind, pull the plug, it's my time. If I have the ability to write, to speak, to think, then yeah, I'll stay. My father actually, he's of the, of the opinion as long as he can, he, he loves Stephen Hawking. <laughs> he's, a, he's a research physicist or, or was before he retired. And as long as he can communicate in some form or another, he wants to keep going. He doesn't care if he's bedridden, doesn't care if he's stuck in a wheelchair, he doesn't care if he can't walk, if he can't feed himself. As long as he can talk or communicate in some form, he wants to, uh, to keep going. I have, you know, extended family that I have discussed it with and friends if anything should ever happen. Uh, I think many people know my wishes that I would not, you know, want to be, have life support, feeding tubes or any of the necessary things to keep me alive if I don't have a certain quality of life. 
having a conversation with your family and your provider. About two weeks ago, my wife and I were talking about it again, and, uh, and I wouldn't let her. I mean, some of it was, let's not talk about this now, and I'm saying, but when, you know, it's not to sound like Yogi Berra, but it's too late when it's too late, right? You ha we have to talk about it now. And just to make sure that, you know, we're very clear on, on what we want and how we want it. My son, who is now 22, and at that time he was uh, 20, he lost a friend of his tragically in a car accident. And um, I took advantage of that time at the funeral. Afterwards, after the funeral, he, my son was very troubled by the, uh, the burial and everything of his, of his friend. And again, I, I've always taken advantage of those times with my family to say, okay, what, what do you want? Just to constantly reinforce um, that they're thinking about it and that, that we're still on the, at the same page. We talked about, okay, if you were to die, do you want your organs donated? Um, you know, how do you want to be handled if, if you're in a situation like that? And he, he definitely was very clear on if there was no hope for you know, any type of recovery that he did not want us to keep him alive. And he did want to be an organ donator. That then prompted us to look at do we have advanced directives? And neither one of us did at that point. And uh, we had the conversations with each other. Could, could he make the decisions for me based on what my needs and wishes were? And um, we had long discussions because it was not very easy. You know, he would, he would say, well, you know, how do I know that, that, you know, it's really not, I shouldn't resuscitate or, um, so we went through examples and um, using the information that um, actually Excellus has provided about creating your advanced directive was really helpful for us. So we both have advanced directives now. After my brother's passing, you know, my mother's health, she didn't have a health care proxy and she's well into her 80s. Um, my sister has it, I think. My niece and nephew have also um, filled out the forms at a very young age. They just got, both got married recently in the last year. So I think it's really important that you have a family conversation. Even though it's not the most comfortable thing and it's really, um, people don't like talking about it. I'm trying to educate my kids and my family members, my siblings, about it's equally as important to, to prepare for your death. Doesn't mean it's going to happen right away, but when it does, guess what? The folks around you that love you the most will be so much more at peace in terms of dealing with it all. Understanding life support or life-sustaining treatment. Life-sustaining treatment supports or replaces failing body functions. It is important to remember that life-sustaining treatment has benefits and burdens. Any treatment can be refused or accepted. One cannot always predict recovery. Life support may be used for a short period of time, which is known as a time-limited trial. Treatment can be stopped. Making treatment decisions is difficult. Making an informed decision takes into account the following. Identifying whether a specific treatment will make a difference. Weighing the benefits and burdens. How a treatment may be helpful and how it may be harmful. Recognizing if there is hope for recovery. If so, what will life be like afterwards? Describing your goals for care and what is important to you. For more information, read the Advanced Care Planning Booklet or view it on the web. Once you have completed your advanced directives, there are two major practical issues to consider. First, accessibility of the advanced directives. And secondly, the need to review and update these documents. Accessibility. To summarize, keep a copy for yourself in a secure place. Give a copy to your healthcare agent and alternate, your primary care physician, all specialist physicians who participate in your care, and the primary hospital where you receive care. Review and update. As you get a little smarter about things, as you get a little older, then your perspectives change. Um, you know, things change for you. you. You want different things. Because of the change of your values and beliefs as you get older and experience different scenarios, you have to continue to have those kind of conversations with your health care agent. 
so that they know how you're feeling today and understand your values and wishes today as opposed to what they might have been 10, 15 years ago. To summarize, it is important to review and update periodically as life changes. With major life events, like after divorce, birth of a child, death of a spouse, you may want to or need to choose a new healthcare agent. Newly diagnosed life-threatening or chronic illness, advancing chronic illness, after complicated life-sustaining treatment. If you change your healthcare proxy and or your living will, you'll need to replace the old forms with new ones that you've signed, dated, and had witnessed. Put them in a safe place and give copies to everyone who needs them. All individuals deserve compassion, support, and education across the continuum of care. The healthcare proxy and living will should be completed by all individuals 18 years of age and older when they are healthy and independent and reviewed regularly along the continuum of care. A new program in form called Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, or MOLST, helps seriously ill patients make healthcare decisions while they still have the ability to do so. MOLST expands on medical orders beyond instructions for cardiopulmonary resuscitation or do not resuscitate orders. These medical orders are signed by a licensed New York State physician and they must be followed by healthcare professionals using established protocols. The MOLST does not replace a healthcare proxy or living will. For more information, view the MOLST video at compassionandsupport.org. Thank you for watching. We hope that these stories have motivated you to begin the advanced care planning process and to complete an advanced directive. It is truly a gift to you and to your family. I know that I have a plan in place should I not be able to make decisions anymore in my life. And I know that my final chapter will be spent the way I want it to. And I won't place that burden on my family. And that gives me a great peace of mind.